Okay, well, God bless you all. Thank you for having me out. And um, we're going to hear from God today. We want to open the Bible to Colossians, the first chapter. Is that a little too sensitive now? Okay. And I'll just keep talking. We're going to be in Colossians, the first chapter. We're going to hear from the Apostle Paul. And he has some important things to tell us. Now I understand um, that the, the theme for this weekend is something like discerning the times or, or staying true to, true to the faith, true to the Word of God. I, I, I understood that was kind of the uh, theme. So that, like it or not, that's what we're going to hear. <laughs> so I'm going to be speaking three times, once tonight, twice tomorrow. And my, um, my topic is our faith. And tonight, our topic is the object of our faith. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about uh, walking in faith, living the faith, or keeping the faith. And then the last lecture I give will be on uh, defending the faith, sharing it and defending it. So the object, living it, and then sharing and defending it. So that's kind of what we want to talk about. So let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse uh, 15. And I'm just going to read a good long chunk of this. Paul says that he, now this is Jesus, he's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not, not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. If you just drop down to chapter 2, verse 3 now, still speaking of Jesus, he says, uh, In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, who is head of all principality and power. Amen. <coughs> Friends, I have an announcement to make. Jesus Christ is very great. He rescued me. I think he probably rescued most of you. He thought of me when I didn't care anything for him. And I came to know the Lord when I was 20 years old. And you just don't recover from something like that. And I never did. And we all have good days and we all have bad days. Uh, but I tell you what, Jesus Christ remains faithful. His word remains true from beginning to end. And it, it really is uh, the guiding light of our lives. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the object of our faith, and that's Jesus. Nothing in our lives ever, ever should eclipse the Lord Jesus. Not anything. Uh, he is to receive the preeminence in all things because he's worthy of it. Paul the Apostle is warning the Colossians. By extension, he warns us. There's a real threat here that wrong views of God and wrong views of the gospel can rob the Christian of a lot of things, but what Paul's talking about here, at least in part, is the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
If Jesus doesn't have the place of ultimacy in your life, you can be robbed, you can be spoiled of wisdom and knowledge. And you need those things to navigate through this life. And Paul's very clear. He says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. And he means that. We must look at God, we must look at Christ correctly, or, it's, or we're just setting ourselves up for disaster. And order our lives in accordance with this faith commitment that we want to make. Paul says, first of all, that God exists. I mean, that's primary. You've got to believe that there's a God, and that this God has revealed himself decisively in the person of Jesus Christ. To look at Jesus is to look at God. In fact, we are told in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1 and verse 3, that Jesus Christ is the very brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. In other words, he, Jesus the Lord shares the same substance and nature as God the Father. He is every bit God as the Father is God. He's not some lesser God. He's not a half man, half God. He's God. In fact, Jesus could, could look at Philip who asked to see the Father, and he could say, Philip, have I been with you so long time? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I remember as a young, a young man just opening the Bible sort of for the first time and being confronted with that verse. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, and I just never recovered. I mean, I'm just fascinated with the idea that God would take a human nature and reveal himself decisively to his created beings, you know, his image bearers. That he would do that. That's amazing. It's breathtaking. I hope it hasn't grown old for you. I mean, that's amazing. In our text that we read, we, we read that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. That, that doesn't mean that he's the first thing that God made. Like our Jehovah's Witness friends want to tell us. Well, well God the Father, is, he's really primary, you know. And he made Jesus, and then Jesus made everything else. So therefore, Jesus is the firstborn of the created order. And that, that's not true. He's the firstborn in terms of what? Preeminence. He receives the preeminence in all things. In fact, our text told us that. And in Psalm 89, we read that David, the greatest king of Israel's monarchy, God made him his firstborn. Highest of all the kings of the earth. That's what it means to say that Jesus is the firstborn. He is the preeminent one. And Jesus, we are reminded in Colossians 1, is the creator. Now, how'd you like to be one of those first apostles, one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, sitting across the table from, from the Lord Jesus, and it starts to dawn on you who you're talking to? You made the world. You made the entire created order. You're the king of eternity. You split the Red Sea for Moses. You were in that burning bush. I mean, that, that's... That's breathtaking. There's hardly any words to, to express that magnificent truth. But we're reminded in Colossians 1 and in Hebrews 1 and in John 1 that as a matter of fact, the creator of the heavens and the earth is none other than the second person of the Trinity, the one we call the Lord Jesus. He's the creator. And therefore, he is the true God. Remember Jeremiah 10? Jeremiah had, was given a message from God to share with the nations, the pagan nations. And Jeremiah was told to tell those pagans that the God of Israel is the true God. He is the living God. He is the everlasting King. In other words, the King of eternity. And that means that all the pagan competitor gods, well, they're fake, and they're dead, and they're finite. And in fact, Jeremiah went on to say that the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from under these heavens and from off of this earth. There's only one God who is God by nature, that's the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Expressed to us, revealed to us, decisively in, in the person, Jesus of Nazareth. And Paul is very, very concerned that the Colossians understand this and keep this primary. Jesus, above all. And that's a message that never gets old. That's a message for us, too. And we're all very busy, and we all have lots of commitments and obligations and all kinds of things that, that uh, are competing for our attention and affection but Jesus Christ must be ultimate, even in that. It's important. And Paul goes on to say that Christ is not just the creator. He didn't just create the world, wind it up like a clock, and then walk away. 
He is the upholder and the sustainer of the world. And remember that, that 17th verse? In Him all things consist. In other words, He holds together this created order. And I do mean everything. And I, I want to talk about that yet tonight before we're done. Paul reminds us that the Lord Jesus, He, he took on flesh. That second person of the Trinity took flesh and He died to make reconciliation with God. A fallen created order can be reconciled to a thrice holy God. And in so doing, Paul tells us elsewhere that God demonstrated his love for fallen humanity. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were enemies in our minds with wicked works against God. It wasn't that we were just happily going along, living our lives. We were indifferent to God. We were hostile to God. We were enemies and we had to lay down our arms. But he extended the olive branch first when Jesus went to the cross, see? And so God says he loved us first. And John, the beloved apostle, said, well, you know what? We love him in return. Remember that? 1 John 4, 19. We love him because what? He first loved us. And love, of course, is to be expressed. You don't just say, I love this, this person, Jesus, and then your life doesn't reflect that love. No, Jesus said... If you love me, you keep my commandments. Remember that? John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. He says in the 21st verse of that 14th chapter, uh, He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. It's very clear. Paul reminds us that in Jesus, are, again, are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, you are not going to reason up, down, or sideways, unless the Christ of Scripture is whom the Bible says He is. And that's important. And hopefully we can touch on that a little bit. But um, I really want us to look at that sixth verse there. Look at Colossians 1, 6. It says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. As you have received Him, walk in Him. What does that mean? I think what Paul is saying is this. When you first came to know Jesus, and I remember this because I was not raised in a Christian home. We didn't care anything about God or His Bible or His Gospel. We didn't consult God for big problems or little problems. No church, no nothing. And when I was enlightened to the truth of Jesus, when He divinely persuaded me, the moment of conversion... You might not know very much. I didn't know very much, but I knew one thing. I knew the Bible was true. From front to back, this book is true. It comes from God. It's telling me the truth about God. It's telling me the truth about me. And I know that the Word of Christ is the ultimate authority. It's the final court of appeal. I'm not going to test it because there's nothing more certain than His Word. It's just, it's got to be the presupposition for my new life now. It has to be the rock bottom foundational starting place in my thinking. That's how you come to faith. You just surrender everything to Jesus. You say, you're the boss now, Jesus, and everything you say is true. And I won't second guess you. You speak on your own authority, Lord. You don't need anybody to back you up. Your word is self-authenticating. The Bible carries its own credentials with it. And you never see Jesus in the Bible. Do you ever see him in the Gospels? teaching on something, and then he says, uh, gentlemen, you know that I'm telling you the truth here, because you can just consult the writings of Rabbi Hillel, or Shammai, or Plato, or maybe Aristotle, or somebody, some brilliant thinker somewhere. No, Jesus never did that, ever. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 8, uh, the Lord is giving testimony about himself to the Pharisees. And th they thought they had him there. They said, hey, just a minute, you are bearing witness to yourself. Your testimony is not true, because you must have two or three witnesses. And what did Jesus say? He said, though I bear witness of myself, my testimony is true. Why? Because he's different. See? He's God. And he doesn't need anybody to back him up. He doesn't need any external witnesses. He doesn't need anyone to support him or validate his word. He speaks on his own authority. And that's important. And friends, it just can't be any other way, can it? It would be irrational. I, I gave a lecture to the Religious Studies Department at the University of Lethbridge 
I was born, I could go to a secular institution. I was invited to go in there and speak on creation. And, they, and the prof, an atheist, mind you, who travels and speaks at these atheist conventions, he invited me to come and he said, we would like to hear your views on creation and we'd like to especially hear what you have to say about salvation. How's that for an invitation? How's that for a door, an open door to walk straight on through? You couldn't get a better invitation than that. But I told the class, I said, listen to the kind of God I'm telling you about here. I realize you don't affirm this, but just please understand and respect at least the internal consistency of what I'm telling you. The God that I'm, that I'm revealing to you here today, telling you about, He is eternal. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He's never learned a thing. He knows everything. He is omnipresent. He is the king who inhabits eternity. And he is omnibenevolent. In other words, he's morally perfect. It's not that he doesn't lie to people. He just chooses not to lie. It's that he cannot lie to people. That's the God that I'm telling you about. Now, in the very nature of the case, it would be stupid to put that kind of God to the test as though there was something more certain in my life than His Word. See? In fact, in Hebrews, the 6th chapter, and the 13th verse, the writer reminds us that when God wanted to prom prom make promises to Abraham, God swore an oath. And you know what He swore by? Himself. And the writer says He swore by Himself because He could swear by none greater. You can't imagine a greater being than the Christian God. There is, none, there is none greater. So in the very, again, friends, in the very nature of the case, you don't put God to the test. You don't, you don't judge His Word. You don't say, well, modern scientific discovery has invalidated this part of the Bible, but at least I can hang on to this other part. Or this brilliant philosopher here, he has shown us a problem with Christian theology, so I'll just jettison this portion of Christian theology, but, but maybe I can hang on to this part. No, we don't do that. The Bible says, let God be true, and every man a liar, for sure. God's word must be true. I love that third verse in that second chapter. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge deposited in Jesus. I want you to think about that. Is that just hyperbole? Is that conscious exaggeration, just to make a point? Or is Paul serious on this one? Paul is serious on this one. And if, he, if, he's, if what he is saying is true, then you wouldn't be able to know anything without Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying. Think about all the things you think you know in this life and ask yourself, how do I really know these things? Are my senses really reliable? Is the world really intelligible? Is memory reliable? What, what does the world have to be to be a place that you can learn things about? What kind of creature do you have to be in order to be a creature that can learn some things? And I want to say, loud and clear, if Christ is not who the Bible says He is, we don't know anything. We have no foundation for any of our knowledge claims that we want to make. And friends, this is profound. But this is Paul's thought, and you can track it all the way through the Bible. Ephesians 4 is a pretty good place to start. Paul says, The non-believer walks in the futility of his mind, in darkness, Tomorrow we want to talk about the great Athenian address that Paul made to the philosophers of Mars Hill. Paul is completely unintimidated by these great thinkers. He said, you men are groping in darkness. You ignorantly worship this unknown God. I will declare him to you. Paul, Paul is just not afraid. He says, I'm going to make a contrast here between your darkness and the light that I'm bringing you. And that's how we must be. All of us, whether we're believers or non-believers, we're all walking around living our lives just assuming that the world's intelligible. It's a place that you can learn things about. And we all just kind of assume that we're the kind of creatures that have the requisite rational and cognitive faculties sufficient so that we can actually learn some things. Now, how do we know that any of that is reality? How do you really know that this is a place that you can learn about? How do you really know you have the mental capabilities to learn anything? 
And you know what? The non-believer has nothing but stunned silence. He doesn't know. He, he can't justify his knowledge claims. He cannot justify any of the reasoning that he's doing. But you see, the Christian has a ready answer. The Christian says, I go to God's Word, and God tells me He made a world that is a cosmos, not a chaos. It's a place where there's law-like regularity, there's a general uniformity, you can make plans for tomorrow. In Christ, all things are held together. It's an ordered creation. And God created us in His image with minds that were designed to learn truth, to discover the truth that's out there. We can justify our knowledge claims. In Genesis 8.22, God said, As long as the earth endures, you'll have summer and winter and sea time and harvest and day and night and cold and heat, they won't cease. And Jesus was talking to the religious leaders in Luke chapter 12, and he said, You gentlemen, you look at the sky, and you say... Red sky tonight, it's going to be nice weather tomorrow. A plus. You see a red sky in the morning, oh, it's going to be foul weather. Right. And oh, here comes the south wind, it's going to be warm. Here comes a cloud coming out of the, out of the west, it's going to be rain today. And Jesus says, that kind of reasoning is valid. We call that induction. That's what we call that. Inductive reasoning. This is how it was yesterday. Rain clouds came out of the west, we had a rain. Jesus said, that kind of reasoning, you are welcome to it. Why? Because the law-like regularity of this world is being held in place by Jesus himself. Now what if you were a non-believer? What if you were a non-Christian? What reason would you have to expect regularity tomorrow? What reason would you have to expect that a red sky at night meant good weather tomorrow? Because you observed that yesterday, that's no guarantee. Who's informing us? Who is enlightening the mind of man? God says He's doing that. That's Job chapter 38 and verse 36. It is God who puts wisdom into the inward parts of man. He teaches understanding to the heart. <coughs> In Psalm 94 and verse 10, we read that it's God that teaches man knowledge. You come into the world a little baby, and soon you're a toddler, and you're learning about the world. How is that possible? Because God has programmed you to do that, to learn true things about the world. What's going on in here, in my mind, really does map on to what's going on out there. Because Jesus is holding all this together. But what if you were a non-believer? How can you get your mind in contact with the world external to yourself? How can you do that? And that is one of the most perplexing problems in the history of philosophy. The Christian has an answer, but the non-believer doesn't like that answer. He doesn't want to hear that God created the world to be intelligible. He doesn't want to hear that we're image bearers of God with rational and cognitive faculties designed by God to get us in contact with the world to, so that we can reach true conclusions about things. I'll just give you one thing to think about and then we'll kind of wrap up here, but Think about mathematics, okay? I, know, I realize it's sort of late in the day, but just think about mathematics. Anyone here enjoy math? Does anyone actually like math? Oh, my goodness. I'll pray for you. <laughs> I personally find math very troublesome, but philosophy of math, now that's something that I'm interested in. The Bible says, and we just read it, in Jesus, all things are held together or all things consist, but that, the Greek word means he's holding things together. And of course, we want to think about the physical world, don't we? We think about rocks and mountains and trees and people and name it all, physical things. We, we can sort of understand how Jesus holds all that together atomically, we'll say. But the Lord Jesus is holding more things together than just that. I think about mathematics, and I have a big, thick math textbook in my office, and I like reading that. Big, long introduction by one of the most brilliant mathematicians of the 20th century. And he has a big, long discussion there in that introduction about mathematics. Math and numbers, he says. They hang uneasily, he says, between the real and the not real. No, the number two doesn't weigh anything. It doesn't take up space. The number seven doesn't weigh anything. 
You can't bounce it on the floor or paint it red. And what about the laws that govern how you treat numbers? We call that mathematics. What about these laws? Where do they come from? Why do they have a prescriptive character to them? A math teacher is obligated to mark a, a test question wrong when her student gets it wrong. You are obligated to fill out your tax information correctly. You don't say, well, it's mathematics, the government won't care. No, there's something prescriptive about mathematics. How is it, and this is, one, again, one of the most difficult problems in philosophy, and no one's ever come to a conclusion on it. How is it that math and numbers which are abstract, non-material, conceptual entities, how is it that those things apply so meaningfully to this changing, physical, concrete world? How do we get these things together? The applicability of math and numbers to the changing, physical world. How do you explain that? One philosopher said she thinks it might just be a happy coincidence. <laughs> and I want to say that the Lord Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, had a plan in mind in eternity past, a mathematical model by which he created this physical order that you are now living in. The world was structured mathematically and, there, and then realized physically. And that's why math and numbers can apply so meaningfully to the physical world. Jesus holds math and numbers together with the physical world. In him, all things consist we can say the same thing about objective moral values and duties, the same thing about the laws of logic. All these abstract, conceptual, hard-to-understand entities that somehow do impose themselves upon us living in this concrete world, this physical world. You can't do it without Jesus. Are you beginning to see? You need Him moment by moment. We don't just call in Jesus for the especially hard problems. We say, Lord Jesus, I need you to reason. Up, down, sideways, moment by moment, I need you. And I can't last one minute without you. Not one moment, not one nanosecond can I exist autonomously. You hold all things together. All things together. And Paul tells us in that 10th verse of the second chapter, you're, you're complete in him. Christian, you're complete in Jesus. Boy, I tell you, every cult leader and every cult member needs to hear that again. You're complete in Jesus. You don't need <coughs> that rabbi. You don't need that pope. You don't need that cult leader. You don't need these guys. Can any? They aren't going to add anything to the finished work of Jesus for you. They didn't shed one drop of blood to secure your redemption. You're complete in Jesus. I say, thank you, Jesus. You're so kind and so great. And Paul says to the. Colossians, by extension, he says it to us. Don't you dare for one minute, not one second, set aside your Christian convictions. Jesus is ultimate. In your life, he should be the ultimate court of appeal, the final authority. And if you set him aside and you pretend neutrality while you're in the middle of an evangelical or apologetical encounter, guess what? You're going to look like the fool that you're talking to. You talk to a non-believer, he, he is, in the nature of the case, a fool. It's foolish to deny God. And Paul would have us to know and believe that if you set aside Christ as primary and try to proceed on neutral ground, this will not work. You'll end up like the fool you're talking to. It is essential that Christ get the preeminence in all things in the church and in our lives. If you want a healthy, productive Christian life and a bold and effective witness. And we can learn a great deal from Paul. Paul says, you watch me. And you mark others who so walk. You have us for an example. And under God, this weekend, that's what we want to do. So friends, um, that's all I really wanted to share with you. I'd like to have a prayer. And then uh, I'm going to get off of here. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Father God, in Jesus' precious and matchless name, we thank you, God, that we can be here uh, in freedom at the camp to, to think about you, Lord, to open your word, to learn from you, and to uh, trust in the Holy Spirit to illuminate this Bible to us, to teach us things maybe we never saw before, and to have the wisdom and the power to order our lives uh, so that it better approximates what we read here in your precious book, your sacred library, 66 books from the hand of God. We thank you, God. Please bless our time together. 
We love and praise you, and we lift up our prayer now in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.